The objectives of this video are the following. We'd like to understand the description of electrons in terms of four things. The main levels, also known as the shells, the sublevels or the subshells, the orbitals, and finally the spin of an electron. So main levels, sublevels, orbitals, and spin. Secondly, we'd like to understand the description of an orbital. Okay? We'd like to be able to describe an atomic orbital as a region of space with a high probability of finding an electron. You'd need to understand that description. Lastly, you'd need to understand and recognize the shapes of S and P atomic orbitals. So let's get started. In a previous video, I had introduced you to this guy there, Niels Bohr. And what Niels Bohr is most famous for is his orbit model of electronic structure. Bohr had uh, posited that electrons basically circled around a positive nucleus in these well-defined orbits, kind of like a planetary model there. Okay? And as we go up further and further away from the nucleus, these electrons have higher and higher potential energies, just like if an object is going further and further away from the center of the planet Earth, it gets higher and higher potential energy. Okay, so we have shells of increasing energy. This model was quite good for some time, but after a while it became incomplete and insufficient to explain a number of phenomena. For example, remember where we had got the model from in the first place in the previous video? We were looking at the emission spectrum of hydrogen, okay, and we had explained that emission spectrum by reference to electrons falling down to lower and lower energy levels, okay? And therefore, the, the convergence of these lines mirrored the convergence of the energy levels. Hopefully, you remember that. If you don't recognize this picture, I recommend that you go watch that video. But even though this model, this orbit model, explains that spectrum for hydrogen, it doesn't explain spectra of species with more than one electron, okay? So, for example, aluminum or aluminium, here's that emission spectrum there. This model does not explain that spectrum. So the model is quite deficient in a number of ways. So the, the alternative model, which is what you need to understand for the IB, is called the orbital model. And within the orbital model, instead of just one, two, three, four, we have what are called sublevels. So we have the main levels and the sublevels. And how do the sublevels go? The n equals one has an s sublevel. Okay, so the sublevels there you can see are s, p, d, and f. The n equals 2 has two sublevels, s and p. I hope you're seeing the pattern. The n equals 3 has three sublevels, s, p, d. n equals 4, four sublevels, s, p, d, and f. Okay? And the important thing now is that, well, one thing is that they keep going, right? So you can keep going 5, 6, 7. And in theory, they keep going f, g, h. But the important thing I wanted to say is that the, the energy, instead of just increasing this way, one, two, three, four, it also increases that direction, okay? So F is higher energy than D, which is higher energy than P, which is higher energy than S, okay? Where do these letters come from, the S, P, D, and F? They come from those words, sharp principle, diffuse, fundamental. You don't really have to think about them for the IB, but those are descriptions of lines on emission spectra, sharp principle, diffuse, and fundamental. How you can remember S, P, D, and F? Just remember that electrons are like speedy flies, SPDF speedy flies, okay? And that'll help you remember the order where F is higher energy than D, which is higher energy than P, which is higher energy than uh, S. Armed with that information, let's answer a question. Which of these sublevels would contain the highest energy electrons? Pause and think about it. Which of these sublevels would contain the highest energy electrons? In three seconds, I give you a clue. One, two, three. There's your clue. In three seconds, I give you the answer. One, two, three. There's your answer. Okay, 4F. Why? Well, two reasons. First of all, four is higher energy than three, which is higher energy than two, which is higher energy than one. So here, four is the highest energy. And F is higher energy than D, higher energy than P, higher energy than S. So it's, it's the highest energy for two reasons, 4F. Okay, let's answer a similar question. Which of these sublevels would contain the highest energy electrons? Well, the same question, <laughs> just different options. Pause and think. 
in three seconds I show you a clue. One, two, three. Here's your clue. In three seconds I show you the answer. One, two, three. There's your answer. This one is really easy. The main levels are going up to three, four, therefore four must be higher energy than the others. Okay? Now we have described now the main levels and the sublevels. Let's think about what orbitals are. So sublevels are further divided into orbitals, which we will represent here. Remember, these are just representations. These aren't, I'm not trying to describe here what an orbital actually looks like yet. Okay, but the sublevels we can represent, sorry, the orbitals we can represent them as squares. So these guys are already squares. So we just have one orbital within the S sublevels. But here we can split this up into three. So we have three orbitals within each of these P sublevels. We have five orbitals which in, within these 4D and, and 3D sublevels. And then we have seven. Notice that it's just a sequence of odd numbers. So 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 2 is 7, and on and on. Now, each of these uh, orbitals can house two electrons. So each orbital can house two electrons. What does that mean? That means then that the maximum number of electrons you can get in, for example, 3s must be 2. 1 times 2 is 2. Here, what's the maximum number of electrons here? It's 3 times 2, which is 6, okay? In the D, we can get five, remember, orbitals, therefore we can get 10 electrons. In the F, we can get seven orbitals, therefore we can get 14 electrons in there. So now we're almost done with our first objective, because our first objective is to understand the description of an electron, of an electron's address in terms of those four things. The main energy level, that's the 1, 2, 3, 4. The sublevel, that's the S, P, D, F. Okay? Then the orbital, so certain orbitals have names. These ones don't have names because there's only one orbital within each um, sublevel. But with, for the P, we have X, Y, and Z. Nice and easy. You have to know that for the uh, IB. So X, Y, Z are the three orbitals within these P sublevels. The D and F orbitals have names as well. You don't have to know them. Okay? So that's the main energy level, the sublevel, the orbital. And finally, there's something called spin. What is spin? We can represent spin as just up or down. So within each orbital, within each house, there are two electrons that live there. One points up, one points down. This spin is a quantum spin, okay? So it's not spin like a bowling ball spinning. It's something very different, but we represent it in a mechanical way anyways, okay? So now we have our four main, uh, our four descriptors of an electron. We have its main level, 1, 2, 3, 4, its sublevel, S, P, D, F, its orbital, for the P we have X, Y, Z, and those are the only ones we care about, and then finally its spin, which is up and down. We can represent this diagram in a slightly different way, called the Madelung sublevel diagram, okay? So we're going to represent this in a slightly different way. Let me show you. Simply, we do the following. On each row, we're going to draw a sort of table. And on each row, we're going to put the types of sublevels that exist within each level. So here we have row 1, we just have 1s. Then here we have 2s, 2p. Then 3s, 3p, 3d. Then 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f. In theory, you could keep on going, but we just need these for the IB. So here we have the main levels 1, 2, 3, 4, and the sublevels s, p, d, f. Okay? And you remember that the 1 level has only one sublevel, that's the S, the two level has only two sublevels, that's SP, and so on and so forth. And below that Madelung diagram, you can put the number of orbitals, which are 1, 3, 5, and 7, that odd number sequence. If you can get this picture into your head, you can reproduce it, you can answer every question in this section of the syllabus. Okay, so armed with that, let's try now and answer a question. How many orbitals are there in an S sublevel? How many orbitals in an S sublevel? Pause and think. In, in uh, three seconds, I show you a clue. One, two, three. There's your clue. In three seconds, I show you the answer. One, two, three. There's your answer. Okay? So you can just remember here, SPDF1357, SPDF1357. Okay? That's the number of orbitals. And here's the representation of that again. So the orbitals within S, we just have one which means we have two electrons within those S sublevels. 
So within those s orbitals. Okay. Let's look at another one. Which of these sublevels does not exist? Now pause. Think about it. Which of these sublevels does not exist? Is it 1s, 2d, 3p, or 4f? What you want to do is draw the Madelung sublevel diagram to try and get this. Okay, I'm going to draw it now. So we have 1s, then 2s, 2p, and 3s, 3p, 3d. Remember, we go speedy fly, so 3d. And then we could go 4, blah, 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 blah. But we don't care about that because we can already see the answer. For the level 2, we only have s and p. There's no d nor is there an F. So this one must be wrong, okay? This one does not exist. And that's the answer to our question, B. Let's look at another one. How many orbitals are there in a 3D sublevel? Pause and think. In three seconds, I show you a clue. There's your clue. One, two, three. Pause and think. I will show you another clue. <laughs> one, two, three. Pause and think. There's your other clue. Now let's see if we can answer the question. How many orbitals are there in a 3D sublevel? Well, in any D sublevel, SPDF, we must have how many? Five, all right? One, three, five, seven. Okay, therefore the answer there is five. My slides are going a bit haywire here, okay? Let's look at another question. Oh no, there's the answer. How many electrons can be contained in the N equals three shell? For some reason, I have shown you the answer. Scrub it off. <laughs> How many electrons can be contained in the n equals 3 shell? How do you answer this? Well, you're going to draw the sublevel diagram again. I'll go ahead and do this. So we have 1s, then 2s, 2p, then we have 3s, 3p, 3d. Okay, and in another color now, I'm going to put the number of orbitals within each of these. We have 1, 3, 5. Okay, I, I didn't get to the f's. We're trying to figure out how many electrons can be fit inside this entire shell. Okay, well in here we have one orbital, three and five, that gives us nine orbitals total, and each orbital can contain two electrons, giving us a total of 18 electrons. Okay, so our answer here is 18. Let's try another one. Which of these electron subshells can hold a maximum of six electrons? Pause, think about it. In three seconds I show you a clue. One, two, three. There's your clue. Which of these subshells can hold a maximum of six electrons? Pause the video again. Think about it. Here's your answer. It's a 3p subshell. Any p subshell will contain a maximum of six electrons. Why? Because they have three orbitals and each orbital can contain two electrons. Three times two gives you six. Here's a final one. A p orbital can contain more electrons than an s orbital. Is this true or is this false? Pause, think about it. In three seconds, I will show you a clue. One, two, three. There's your clue. Pause again, think. Three seconds, one, two, three. There's your answer. So all orbitals can hold only two electrons. Therefore, this is false. The difference between p and uh, s is that in the P, you have three orbitals within each sublevel. In the S, you just have the one. So now I think we've, we've finished this objective. We can describe an electron in terms of its main level, one, two, three, four, its sublevel, SPDF, its orbital, which is just XYZ in the case of the P orbitals, the P sublevel, and its spin, which is just up or down. Let's look at this next one. Try and understand what an atomic orbital is. So we already know what an orbit is. An orbit is a defined path around a revolving body. A defined path of a revolving body, I mean. So here is an electron circling a positive nucleus and it's going in a defined path. We call that path its orbit. But this isn't actually how electrons move. Electrons move in a mo much more haphazard manner. Kind of like that, going about like uh, bees. I told you electrons are speedy flies, right? But over time, if you observed this electron, you would notice it tended to stay within a certain boundary shape. Within a certain boundary shape. And that boundary shape, that area, that 3D region, which uh, basically um, inscribes a high probability of finding an electron, is what we call an orbital. 3D region of space where you have a high probability of finding an electron. Okay, And that is what an S orbital looks like. It's a spherical. 
This, by the way, is what hydrogen looks like. Okay, so hydrogen, you know, is just a nucleus and an electron. This is the old model. That is the new model of what hydrogen would look like. Okay, let's look at a more complicated uh, atom. Let's look at oxygen. Oxygen with two electrons in its inner shell and six electrons in its outer shell. Let's see what that would look like in terms of its quantum mechanical description, the SPD and the F. So here's what that looks like. In a future video, I will explain how we go about filling up these orbitals, but for now, just observe it. What do you notice? You notice that in these two orbitals here, we have two electrons each. Then here we have two and then one, one. Okay, we also notice it goes 1s, 2s, and then 2p. We don't need to understand how to fill that in yet, but just observe it. And I'm going to show you now what actually these things we've been representing as squares, these orbitals, what do they actually look like? Here is what that first orbital looks like, the 1s. It's just a sphere, okay? And like I said, we can fit two electrons within it. And the 2s, what does that look like? It's also a sphere, but it's bigger. And we can fit one electron in it, that green electron there, and we can fit another one, okay? So two electrons in that bigger sphere. And you can see that the, the green ones are have a wider boundary shape than the orange ones, okay? Now we move to the 2p. What, what do the p uh, orbitals look like? 2px looks like that, a dumbbell, okay, with two lobes. Notice that even though we have only one electron at the moment, the electron is not confined to just one lobe. It moves through both lobes, okay? Now we do the 2py. It's also a dumbbell, but it's pointed in a different direction. It's oriented along the y-axis. The 2pz is oriented along the z-axis, going in and out of the board, but we represent it diagonally because I live on a 2D board here, okay? And now we can fit in that last electron into the 2px, so that now we have two electrons in this dumbbell-shaped uh, region of high probability uh, electron density there, okay? So we can also add these descriptors here, the px, py, and pz. So if you're asked to draw, to represent the um, electronic configuration of oxygen, this is what you would draw. Obviously, you can't draw it with the moving electrons. So now I think we have covered this second part. We can describe the atomic orbital as a region of space with a high probability of finding an electron. And we've also kind of done this one. You recognize the shapes of S and P atomic orbitals, but let's do it in a bit more detail. So for the IB, we only need to know the shapes of S and P orbitals. Okay, what, are, what do the S orbitals look like? They're spheres of bigger and bigger radiuses, or radii. There's one subtlety though. As we go up the bigger and big, bigger spheres, if we were to slice these spheres, we notice that they have a sort of onion pattern. So for the 1s, the, the electron likes to be all around here, okay? For the 2s, there are two regions where the electron likes to be. This space in the middle, and then this, this dark area, it doesn't like to hang around there, but then it likes to hang out in the next sort of concentric circle. Here we have three concentric circles where the electron likes to hang out, and so on, and so forth, okay? So we have concentric high probability, then low probability regions of space where the electron likes to hang out. It's kind of like if you cut open an onion and the electron likes to be in the white parts of the onion, but not the dark parts, okay? So that's the shape of the S orbitals there. How about the P? So we have, we have three uh, different P sublevels here to describe, but we only really care about the first one, okay? So one P does not exist. Here's what 2p, x, y, and z look like. I've already shown you, okay? Dumbbells oriented are along those axes at 90 degrees to each other, okay? How about uh, the 3p? Well, the 3p is also x, y, and z, but because it's three, they have now that onion pattern. So you have multiple layers. You don't have to think about this for the IB, really, just, just these ones, okay? So just these ones and the spheres, and you're good. But these keep going on and on, adding more and more layers. The D and the F, again, this is not on the IB, extracurricular information for you, but they start to look really crazy. So here are the D shapes there, okay? And they go on and on. And here are the F shapes, all seven F, F orbitals there, okay? And priorly, I sh had shown you that you see there are five different shapes for the five different 3D orbitals. 
Okay, now you might be asking me, where do these shapes come from? Right? Very weird <laughs> representations. What do they actually mean? Well, I don't understand what they actually mean. Probably you won't as well, but I can give you a clue. Okay, I can give you a clue. They come from a field called spherical harmonics. What is spherical harmonics? We treat an electron not entirely as a particle moving around, but also as a wave. Okay, you might have heard of wave-particle duality. When things are so small, they behave both as a wave and as a particle. Okay, so we treat it as a wave, and we imagine that it has a certain vibrational pattern. And we can describe that vibrational pattern in terms of vibrational waves on a sphere. For example, a water balloon bouncing, okay, or a yoga ball bouncing. And so as we watch this water balloon bouncing, we will see temporarily flickers of those kinds of shapes being described there. For example, let's take a look. And we will see the donut shaped. You see that weird donut shape formed temporarily there, okay? And then we will see this bilobed dumbbell shape also form temporarily there, okay? And we have other shapes with more and more lobes. If we take these shapes, these vibrations, and we isolate them and exaggerate them, then we get those waveforms being represented there. And that's where we get the orbital shapes from. Okay. Based on this now, let's answer some questions. Which of these correctly describes the shape of a single p orbital? Pause, think about it. In three seconds, I show you a clue. One, two, three. There's your clue. In three seconds, I show you the answer. One, two, three. There's your answer. Okay. Let's look at another one. I think this is the last one. How many electrons can be contained in a 3s orbital whose cross-sectional representation is shown below, shown over there? Pause again. Three seconds. Pause the video, I mean. Okay. In three seconds, I show you the answer. One, two, three. Oh, no, there's a clue first. There's a clue. This is a bit of a trick question. Okay. Now I show you the real answer in three seconds. There's your answer. The answer is D. All orbitals co contain only two electrons. Okay. Whatever the shape, the crazy shapes, the simple shapes, any orbital can contain only two electrons. Okay. And with that now, I think we have covered this last one quite thoroughly. You can recognize definitely the shape of an S and a P atom atomic orbital, and hopefully you will also still remember those prior objectives. And therefore we are done, and so I will say bye-bye, and I will see you in the next video.